Well, thank you very much, South Carolina, and happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Your great state is getting a lot of news lately. We're doing very well. We're up about 65 points. Is that enough? 65. I'm thrilled to be back in this beautiful state with thousands of hardworking, God-fearing American patriots. And thanks to proud citizens like you, last month we won Iowa by the largest margin in GOP history. That's a long time. And then we won New Hampshire with more votes, listen to this one, than any candidate has ever gotten in either party. Other than that, we didn't do very well there, right? We got more votes than any candidate. Think of that. What an honor. So many years it's been going on. What an honor. Last week, we won the Virgin Islands in a landslide, and then we won over 99 percent in the Nevada caucuses with more votes than anyone has ever gotten in the Nevada caucus. So there's something going on, and now we're going to win a gigantic victory in just a few days, if you think about it. Next week, sort of. I guess you could say sort of next week. In South Carolina. Thank you. The primary is Saturday, February 24th, but in person. Early voting is underway right now, so go and vote. I think we're going to have a big victory. It's looking very good, looking very strong. In fact, a lot of people are saying, what the hell is she wasting her time for? And I agree with that. It ends on February 22nd, and it's closed this Sunday, the 18th, and Monday, the 19th, for President's Day. But you just go vote early or get there. It doesn't, frankly, from my standpoint, just vote. Whether you do it then or whether you do it early, just go and vote. Nikki Haley is pushing Democrats to vote, so if you don't want liberals and Marxists to meddle in your primary, which they shouldn't be able to do, then you have to get out and get every patriot you know come out this week and vote for our campaign. It's going to be over very quickly, very, very quickly. With your help, we're going to win this state. And this November, we're going to win the White House, and we're going to take back our country. Right, Henry? One of the most important issues in this race is which candidate can rescue the American economy and save the American dream. You don't hear about the American dream for quite a while. It's the American nightmare right now. Under the Trump administration, you were far better off. Your family was better off. Your neighbors were better off. Your communities were better off. And our country was a lot better off than it is today. Today, our country is going to hell. It's going to hell. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. Millions and millions of people pouring in from places unknown. America was stronger, richer, safer, and more confident than ever when I was sitting behind that beautiful resolute desk in the Oval Office. Together, we built the greatest economy in the history of the world with record tax cuts, record regulation cuts, record energy production. We were doing a lot of records and rising wages for Americans of every race, religion, color, and creed. That's why Hispanic Americans, African Americans, Asian Americans, women, men, young students with a brilliant education, young students with no diploma, no education to speak of, every single group was doing better. There wasn't a group that was not doing as well. But then crooked Joe Biden came in and began waging an all-out economic war on our great middle class. That's what's happened, by the way. That's what's happened. Let's compare the smoldering records of Bidenomics. How about that name, Bidenomics? With the incredible success we had just three years ago under President Trump on Maganomics. Did you ever hear that term? I just heard it. I just heard it. And I like it. I said, let's use it, everyone. Let's use it in South Carolina. <laughs> Under Biden, we've had a three-year inflation rate of over 30 percent, and inflation was higher than expected yet again. You see, they just announced the numbers two days ago. It's back. 60 percent of Americans are now struggling to pay for their groceries. You didn't have that. 
And as Crooked Joe himself foolishly pointed out on Sunday, it's not just that prices are getting higher, it's that packages are getting smaller. Thank you for telling that, Crooked Joe. Worst president in the history of our country, by far. In fact, Jimmy Carter is a very happy man because his administration is brilliant by comparison. Under my leadership, you had virtually no inflation, and there was no such thing as Joe Biden's shrinkflation. You ever hear that one? Shrink. That's his new name he comes up with. Under Crooked Joe, energy prices have reached the highest in history, and gas prices have reached 5 6 and even $7 a gallon. And now it seems like they're going up again. They're doing everything they can. They'll use anybody to send it around. They want to do anything they can. But after the election, they can't. We can't let them win. We're not going to have a country. But after the election, if a tragedy happened, like happened three years ago, that was a tragedy, what happened. That was a tragedy. Look what's happened to our country. Our country's gone to hell. But if a tragedy happened, you'd see prices, energy prices, go up double and triple. Three years ago, under my leadership, we had energy independence and soon would have had energy dominance. We're going to be dominant all over the world. We started, you know, we started, we were behind Saudi Arabia, Russia. Within the first year, we were way beyond them in terms, you know, we have more liquid gold under our feet, just think of it, than any other nation. And we don't want to use it. They want to go all electric cars. Isn't that a great idea? They don't go far. They don't go far. I had ga gas — think of the gasoline, gas prices. And we had some times where it was below this number, $1.87 per gallon. Think of that. Doesn't that sound good? You could buy those big, beautiful trucks. Now you say, let's get a little one. Thanks to Bidenomics, a 30-year mortgage rate has hit a 22-year high, the highest in over 22 years. Average mortgage payments now are brutal, $3,322 a month. When I was president, the average monthly mortgage payment was $1,700 a month, nearly 50 percent less than what you're doing right now. You had a savings with me of $19,000 a year. That's a lot. And this is an affordability crisis. Remember, under Crooked Joe Biden, credit card debt is the highest in history. Never been higher. That's a tragic number. Over $1 trillion for the first time ever. It's never been even close to that. 62 percent of Americans now report living paycheck to paycheck. Under President Trump, me, Americans liberated themselves from debt by paying off roughly $150 billion from their credit cards, the only major decline in decades, the first time in decades that it was happening. And while Crooked Joe likes to brag about the stock market, the truth is his record is horrendous when you correct for inflation, which is an amazing number. After adjusting for all that has taken place over the last couple of years, but think of it, with all of the inflation and everything else, the stock market is up just 8 percent total for the entire period. By contrast, under my leadership, the stock market was up by an astounding 62 percent with inflation almost at zero, 62 percent. In short, Crooked Joe Biden did our economy exactly what he did to our border. He's done it to our economy and our border, you've never seen. Have you ever seen anything? Look, forget about speeches. Have you ever seen anything where millions of people are allowed to pour in? Millions and millions. He inherited an amazing success from me. He wrecked it almost immediately. He turned it into something resembling much worse, actually. Not resembling, much worse than a third world nation, a banana republic. There's never been a border in the history of the world that's looked anything like this tragedy. It's a tragedy. And he can shut it down. All he has to do is say, close the border. We got to get our country straightened out. And he doesn't want he wants he wants to have some phony legislation passed, which actually makes it worse. But with your vote, we're going to save our economy and we're going to bring our country back from hell. That's where it's been. That's where it's been. The next Trump economic boom will begin on November 5th, 2024, right? 
Upon taking office, I will end Joe Biden's war on American energy, cancel his ban on exporting American natural gas, beautiful, clean natural gas, and we will drill, baby, drill. Bring it way down. I will revoke China's most favored nation's trade status, and we will impose stiff penalties on China and other trade abusers. They're abusers. Don't forget, I took in hundreds of billions of dollars from China. No president's ever done anything like it. Under my policies, no company will ever want to even think about firing their U.S. workers and outsourcing new jobs to foreign countries, like is happening now at record levels, and we stopped it. Because if they do, those countries are going to pay a very steep price, and that's why they didn't do it. They didn't play games with us. We will once again live by the maxim of the Trump administration, buy American, hire American, buy and hire American. <laughs> to protect South Carolina workers, I will also pass the Trump Reciprocal Trade Act. You know what reciprocal trade is? When they screw us, we screw them. It's very simple. <laughs> if China or any other country makes us pay a 100 or 2 per Think of this, it happens all the time. We now, we did, we did a lot. We did, we did very nicely with China. They aren't doing well right now because of the tariffs and taxes I put on. If China or any country puts on a 100 or 200 percent tariff, we will make them pay a reciprocal tariff of 100 or 200 percent right back. If they charge us, we charge them. And as tariffs on foreign countries go up, taxes on American workers and families will come down very dramatically. We'll take in a fortune. You know, it's uh, an amazing thing that that hasn't been done. We were doing it at levels never seen. We were taking in hundreds of billions. We were taking in billions and billions of dollars. And it was easy. It was really easy, amazing. And we kept a lot of businesses going. We saved the steel industry, but now they're blowing it. Did you see where U.S. steel was just bought by Japan? How about that? Okay, can you imagine? I wouldn't let that, I wouldn't let that happen. It will almost solve our budget deficit in one fell swoop if we do this reciprocal act. Think of it, reciprocal trade act. They charge us, we charge them. And then you have senators and some people that say, no, what's wrong with it? It's perfect. That's called Make America Great Again. That's what they do to us. And other countries will not be allowed to rip us off any longer, which is what they're doing. The only ones who hate it are the globalists, because basically they hate America. In a certain way, they actually hate our country. By contrast, crooked Joe Biden's plan for his next term raises your taxes over $6 trillion. Do you know that? including a colossal tax hike, the biggest — this will be the biggest tax hike in history for you, the people in this room, and everybody else. Millions of middle-class families, they're going to take away your Trump tax cuts. So I gave you the largest tax cuts in the history of our country, and they want to take them back. That's not going to happen very easily, I will tell you. I will make the Trump tax cuts permanent. You know, they expire in a year. And we will cut your taxes even more than that. You know, we took in more revenue after the tax cuts than we ever took in before, because the tax cuts inspired investment. But Crooked Joe is not the only massive tax hiker in this race. You also have a person known as Nikki Birdbrain, Haley Birdbrain, who tried to double your gas tax here in South Carolina and also supports a 23 percent national sales tax. By the way, Henry will never do that. That's for sure. I will never let that happen to you. It's not going to happen. Henry wouldn't let it happen either, frankly. The radical left Democrats want Nikki Haley because they know she's easy to beat. Look at her polls. Her polls are terrible against Biden. She wants to gut Medicare and Social Security and raise the retirement age by 10 years. How about Social Security? You have another year to go, and then you learn it's not a year. It's going to be 11 years to go. I don't know. Somehow, some people aren't going to like that too much. That's what she wants to do. She's wanted to do that for a long time. She gave land away to China, but most importantly, I'm beating Biden in almost every poll by a lot, whereas she loses to Biden in virtually every poll. And her numbers, by the way, are tanking. Her numbers are going down. As she gets angrier, crazier, and suffers deeper, deeper scars from Trump 
derangement syndrome. She's got a terminal case. Terminal case, Trump derangement syndrome. Not a nice thing. There are many people afflicted with it. Most of them are gone. On the amnesty bill, Nikki sided with crooked Joe Biden. I sided with the American people. She sided with Biden. Nikki has gone so far left because of her Democrat donors. She's actually got very little money now because they all gave up because she's given like there was one poll that said she has no chance. That's pretty tough. Zero. I give her a one percent. I don't really mean it, but I give her a one percent. And that she's not just attacking me. She's actually attacking the entire. Re she is really going after the Republican Party. And that's very bad. We got to beat Biden. We got to beat Biden. Three years ago, she said, all of us who worked with Donald Trump witnessed the tremendous amount of love and respect he has for our military. He was determined to protect our military. We had many conversations in the NSC meetings about protecting them. He loved our military so much, is what she said. Now she says, well, I don't know too much about him and the military. And on that, though, she was correct. I love our military. You have a big military here. I love our vets. I've taken care of our vets like no president has ever done. No president has ever given the vets what I gave them. I gave her the job at the United Nations, 90 percent for one reason, because I wanted to make Henry McMaster the governor of the great state of South Carolina. And he's done a great job. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Peggy, thank you for being here. Thank you, Henry. Nikki is also political best friends with a guy named Mitt Romney. Has that one ever heard of? That's not a good thing. Who has run, really, I mean, he's been run out of office, essentially. Remember, he was with the mask running down Pennsylvania Avenue with Antifa. I said, this guy's not good. No, he didn't run because he couldn't have had my support. And in Utah, he couldn't have won the race. He could not have won. So he didn't leave very easily, but he left. He's gone. He's gone. Unless he changes his mind, maybe he will. I hope he does. Then he goes down in defeat. And she seriously thought about supporting a gentleman named as Barack Hussein Obama. Well, it's right on the tape. I don't know if they're going to put up that tape, but it's right on that tape. Barack Hussein Obama, she wanted to support him, and she decided to go with Romney instead. That's all we have to know about her. I uh, don't want to waste a lot of time on her because we have much more important subjects, so we'll get to it. But it's no wonder Joe Biden and his thugs are so de and They are desperate. They are desperate. Do you see this guy on television today? I mean, he's, he's like a crazed lunatic. Round eyes. The eyes are all round as hell. But I know he didn't have any plastic surgery. I know. The eyes are round. Foreign leaders look at him and they say, you got to be kidding. They only know that we are the only, and they know this, that we are the only ones who are going to stop the Democrats. We're going to stop. They're going to destroy our country. That's why they're weaponizing law enforcement for high-level election interference. That's what they've done. It's all election interference. They love to talk about disinformation and democracy. It's all disinformation. They're great at cheating on elections, and they're great at misinformation, disinformation. Similar, not the same thing, but both. Because they're the ones who are weaponizing the DOJ and the FBI our election systems and attacking free speech. And they're also going into the states and they're getting the district attorneys and they're getting the it, these people are really bad for our democracy. He is a threat to our democracy for numerous reasons. Number one is he's grossly incompetent. That's number one. Number two, they're weaponizing law enforcement against their political opponent. In the case of me, it's me who's the political opponent. And because we're leading him by so much, it doesn't make it any easier, probably for him or for us, but we're leading by so much, partially because the people of our country get it. Congress ought to impeach crooked Joe Biden for attacking his political opponent by weaponizing the DOJ, the FBI, and even the local DAs and attorney generals against his political opponent. They ought to impeach him, because that is the most undemocratic thing that you can do. This happens in 
certain countries, but never happened in our country. All of this persecution is only going on because I'm running for president and leading big in the polls, beating Nikki by 36 points in the latest South Carolina poll, and beating Biden by 15 points in the latest morning console poll. Remember, I always used to talk about polls, right? Always, because to me, it's very important. Only I would talk about them if they were good. If they were bad, I didn't bother with them. But they're good. They're the best polls we've ever had. I actually think their weaponization of DOJ, FBI, I actually think that's driven our numbers way up because people don't like it. They're not going to stand for it. In the latest morning console poll, we're at 80 percent in the Republican primary. We're dominating everybody. And then when you go over to the Democrats, Crooked Joe in the general election, we're leading by landslide margins. And they're very worried about it. I don't know. Personally, I don't think he makes it to the starting gate. I, I hate when they compare him to me. He's old. He's broken. He's incompetent. But let's also talk about Trump. You know, I stand up here. I make these speeches all the time all the time. We have the biggest crowds in history. In history. If I didn't have it, you'd know before anybody. Front Row Joes would know. Our great people from North Carolina. Over here, we have like 35 women. They follow me. North Carolina, they follow me all over the country. They're beautiful. They're great. I don't know what the hell their husbands are saying. This is, I think, their 117th Stop. But Front Row Joe's, you may even top it, right? These are serious. How many, how many stops? Yeah, in the, in the 90s. All right, they beat you. The women from North Carolina won. That's all right. But no, but there's never been anything like this. Look, we do these rallies. They're incredible. This isn't really a rally. This was a stop. And we have thousands of people outside that can't even get in. It's amazing. And, you know, yesterday she had a rally. Nine people showed up. Nine people. She's finished. In fact, our lead against Biden is now 6.7 points, 9 points, 11 points, and even one at 15 points. And the betting markets all over the world, the betting markets have us beating Biden by 21 points. We have to do that. And, and by the way, she's getting clobbered. She's getting clobbered by the Democrats, even though she probably is one. I think she probably is. They're putting up her money. They have the biggest Democrat supporters giving her money, because Republicans aren't. They think it's a hopeless case. But don't let that fool you. They cheat like hell. So everyone has to go and keep your eyes wide open for the cheaters and vote, vote, vote. You got to do that. And the primary just coming up, I know you think we're going to win by a lot, and I think we are by probably a record. We've broken every record so far. We've broken Iowa, New Hampshire. Uh, we broke every one of them. Every record, every place we've run, Nevada, we broke. The Virgin Islands, we got 100 percent of the vote. We've broken every record, and I think we're going to break the record here. But it doesn't matter. You have to go vote, because we have to show in November the kind of a movement that we have. There's never been a movement like this in the history of our country. This is MAGA. This is MAGA country. This is MAGA country. And, you know, when Biden gets up and he barely can read, he can barely stand. Remember, he used to say, I'd like to take him to the back of the barn. And everyone thought it was so cute. When I said I'd love to go back there with that guy, it'd take about two seconds. I'd go like this. <laughs> He'd go down so fast. But when I said it, they said the fake news. But look at all that fake news. When I, when I said it, when I said it, they said, he's the fascist. He's a fascist. When he said, oh, isn't that nice? When I said it, they said he's a fascist. No, I'm not a fascist. They also said, years ago, remember Hillary Clinton? I don't call her crooked anymore. I use that term for Joe. We don't need to. We don't care about her so much. To me, she's beautiful, Hillary. She's a very beautiful woman. But when I was talking and speaking and all the things that we do so beautifully, so nice. You know, it's very interesting. I've never had an empty seat, right? 
This place is packed. They're all packed. I never get credit for being a great speaker. I don't know if I'm a great speaker or not. Who the hell knows? I never get credit. What? I never get credit. I don't know. Henry thinks I'm a very good speaker. But you know, no, every rally, like this one turns out, they're all rallies because if we have a thousand people, 10,000 people show up, they're all rallies. But they come by the thousands. We never have empty seats. We never have anything empty. We usually have to put screens like this outside so people can see. We did it in Nevada. We did it in New Hampshire. We were going to do it in Iowa, but it was 40 degrees below zero in Iowa. And by the way, the electric cars were not working too well. They don't work well in cold weather. And that was seriously cold. I had a walk from here to, like, the stairway that Joe Biden can't find. See the stairway over there? Can never find. Where's the stair? Here, here was moves. His move. And yet, <laughs> they're going to show it. Every time I show it, I get in trouble. You know why? Because these fake news people who are among the most corrupt people in the world. It's true. They say, look. Donald Trump could not find his way off the podium. So I imitate Biden, and in one case, there was a wall, like that. A lot of times, we have people back there. Do it. And these are the front row Joes they've seen. But here's the risk. Whenever I do it on the newscast, Donald Trump had a hard time finding his way off a platform. There were five different stairways. One. Two, three, four, five. It's real easy. He's the only guy in history that cannot find it. But when I do it, they show it at night. They show me mimicking him, and they say, Donald Trump could not find his way off the platform. These are very dishonest people. When I say, Barack Hussein Obama is the President of the United States, meaning there's a lot of control there because the one guy can't put two sentences together. So I say, Barack Hussein Obama. Remember Rush used to go, Barack Hussein Obama. You go, Barack Hussein Obama. But he'd, he'd do that, Rush. Do we miss Rush? Yes. But when I say that Obama is the president of our country, blah, 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 they go, he doesn't know that it's Biden. He doesn't know. So it's very hard to be sarcastic. When I interpose, because I'm not a Nikki fan, and I'm not a Pelosi fan, and when I purposely interpose names, they said he didn't know Pelosi from Nikki, from Tricky Nikki, Tricky Nikki. He didn't know I interpose, and they make a big deal out of it. I said, no, no, I think they both stink. They have something in common. They both stink. And remember this. When I make a statement like that about Nikki, that means she will never be running for vice president. She will never be running with me for vice president. Remember that. There are things you can say about people. Do you ever see where, you know, you're really hitting one person, they're hitting you, you know, but it goes to a level. But we're at the level now, I am in particular, you know, bird brain and lots of other things. There are things that when you say that you're never going to have her, so. I hope nobody wants her, because I think she's absolutely terrible. She's terrible. So you're never going to have her, and I don't think anybody is very devastated. We do have a lot of great people, by the way. We do have a lot. Of, he's screaming, Tim's got. By the way, I tell Tim, Tim's here someplace. I tell Tim, because I watch his campaign. And you know the truth? It, it was a beautiful thing in a way. He's a modest person. And I called him up, because he was defending me on Deface the Nation. Did you ever watch? Ladies and gentlemen, CBS, ladies and gentlemen, it's Tim Scott on Deface the Nation, because they do, or Meet the Fake News. Remember, most of it, ABC, this is ABC Fake News. They're all fake. They're horrible. You know, if they ever turned conservative to a conservative way, or let's say it differently, if they ever turned to common sense, you know what? Their ratings would triple. I tell the top people, I said, if you ever went common sense, your ratings were triple. But I told Tim, so he was, uh, look, he did well, but he wasn't as forceful as he is. 
because he feels, you know, he doesn't want to talk about himself. It's sort of interesting. And then I see him on Deface the Nation and Meet the Press and all the stuff, and he's just killing everybody. And I called him, I said, you know, you're a much better candidate for me than you were for yourself. I mean it. This guy is the best. He was like a different person. He was like a different person. And I say that with admiration, because I'm the opposite. I'm much better for me than I would be for somebody else. I would be terrible. I'd be terrible. If I was in that position, I'd get up, all right. I did a great job. You should have voted for me. You made a man. But this guy's okay. All right, I'm going home. No, I would be terrible. I'd be the opposite of Tim, but that shows great character with Tim. It really does. Where is Tim, by the way? Where is he? I mean that so strongly. What a he's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. No, he's amazing. He has been Henry, you know what I mean. I watched him the other day on the Sunday shows. He is just destroying people for me. But he didn't act that way for himself. And he said to me, I find it harder to talk about myself than to something I believe in, something other than myself that I believe in. I thought it was beautiful, and I want to thank him very much. Great guy. The radical left Democrats rigged the presidential election in 2020, and we're not going to allow them to rig the presidential election in 2024. Every time the radical left Democrats, Marxists, communists, and fascists indict me, I consider it a really great badge of honor. Thank you very much. It's a lot of fun. I'm being indicted for you, and never forget, our enemies want to take away my freedom because I will never let them take away your freedom. I won't let them take it. That's where they are. That's what they want. They want to silence me because I will never let them silence you. And in the end, they're not after me. They're after you. I just happen to be standing in their way. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, but I'm happy we're doing it. I'm delighted to be doing it. And I'm also delighted to be joined today by one of the greatest governors in the history of our country, in my opinion. I'm so proud of him because I did fight for him and First Lady Peggy to get in that position because I knew how good. You know, when I was running, I have a lot of friends in South Carolina, but when I was running, I dealt with Nikki for years. I gave her many contributions to the governor's, you know, thing, and she's a, one of the governor's association deals, so just a lot of money. And I said, uh, I'm sure she's going to be for me. When I called her, I announced, and then I called her. I got no response. Then I called her again and again and again and again. And I said, she, she's not calling back. And I said, who's the lieutenant governor? Because I heard good things about him. It was a man named Henry McMaster. I said, I called him. Call me back. He said, you know what? I love what you stand for. I love everything about you. And I would be honored to support you. And she supported somebody else. I don't want to say who, because frankly, he's a friend of mine. So, you know, when I become friends after wars, I get along very well with people, so I'm not going to say who, but she supported somebody else. And I had Henry and Peggy going around from 6 o'clock in the morning till 12.30 in the evening, virtually every day for like a month. And we ended up winning like nobody has ever won before, right? Nobody's ever won this state like we won. We had a record. But we're more popular today, Henry, than we were then. But Henry, uh, seven years ago, Henry and Peggy were unbelievable. And I didn't know him too well. I said, boy, that guy's doing a job. I was saying, who, who are the hardest workers? Well, probably the lieutenant governor. Anyway, in the end, we crushed her. She was like nothing. We crushed her. And I said, this is the most incredible thing. This man, I am so much, I was telling this at the victory speech, I said, I would much rather have the lieutenant governor on my side than the governor, because he's far more effective. And that's what happened. You have one of the greatest governors in the history of the state, one of the greatest governors in our country. Henry McMaster and Peggy, our first lady. We love you, Peggy. Thank you very much. Huh? Thank you very much. We're very proud of you. Very proud of you. And then we just said, talked about him, Senator Tim Scott. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great job. 
Congresswoman Nancy Mace. We've come a long way. We've come a long way. Thank you very much, Nancy. I appreciate it. Treasurer Curtis Loftus. Curtis, he's here. I just saw him. Thank you. And a young gentleman who's got a big future, who the, who's got a great father. Oh, I loved when he spoke up in Congress. I'm sure you all forget. Oh, did, that was a beautiful thing. It made him very popular. Nobody knew it at the time, but it was something very special, actually. South Carolina Attorney General Alan Wilson. Say hello, say hello to Joe. Alan, say hello to Joe. Thank you very much. Thank you. South Carolina Secretary of State, a really good guy, a supporter for a long time, Mark Hammond. Thank you, Mark. Great job. A man who's been incredible as a friend, but incredible as an ambassador, Ed McMullen. You did a great job, Ed. And you have a lot of representatives, a lot of people from Congress from different states, but I just have to say, State Representative Stuart Jones has been terrific. And thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. Appreciate it. And a man who I met a long time ago, he was protecting me. He had more bicycles than any human being on Earth. He formed a thing called Bikers for Trump. And I would go around, I'd see like sometimes a thousand by i have never seen anything like it. And I felt so safe. I'd go make speeches. They wouldn't even go into the speech. They were circling the arena or wherever I was. They said, we don't want to go in. We know what you're saying, but we want to make sure you're safe. He's unbelievable. His name is Chris Cox, and he's the head of Bikers for Trump. Where's Chris? Incredible. Thank you, Chris. Look at those arms. I want to expose my arms like that. It might be the end of my political career. If I walked up like that, I think that might be the end, but who knows? Hey, Chris, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Great guy. Great guy. From the very first day that we take back the White House from crooked Joe Biden, and he is, he's the most crooked president we've ever had. He's the most incompetent president we've ever had. And he's the worst president we've ever had. Other than that, he's actually doing quite a good job. He's a disaster. And you know, I never spoke about him this way. You know that. But when I got indicted the first time, it's all, all of these cases and all of these indictments are all him. It's him and his corrupt Department of Justice. But all of these indictments, when I got indicted, I said, I can't believe it. Nobody thought it was going to happen. The fake news always said, well, they'll never do that to an ex-president who was very popular. We got more votes than any sitting president in history. I mean, we were very popular. But when they did that, I said, well, I'm going to tell the truth. He is the most incompetent president we've ever had, the most corrupt, and he's the worst president we've ever had. What he's done just on the border, what he's done in Afghanistan, I was getting out, but we were going to get out with dignity and strength, and it would have been faster. But if had the election been not rigged, it would have been faster, much faster. But we got out. We looked like cowards. It looked like a surrender. It was the worst moment, I believe, the most embarrassing moment in the history of our country. And it gave Putin the idea of going in, because there was no chance that he would ever go into Ukraine. Would, there was zero chance. And he looked at that, and he looked at the stupidity where they take the soldiers out first. They left $85 billion worth of military equipment behind. They left American people behind. And 13 soldiers were killed, and 38 were literally obliterated with the arms, the legs, the face. What happened to those 38? And nobody talks about them. I talk about them all the time, all because of grossly incompetent people. When we win, I believe we're going to have the four greatest years in the history of our country. We're going to turn it around. We're going to turn it around fast. In our first term, we appointed over 300 federal judges and three great Supreme Court justices. Did a great job. A record. And for our great veterans, we passed VA accountability and VA choice, and nobody thought it was possible. And we had to get that through Congress. We had accountability. We had choice. You know, we had thousands of people, Henry, thousands and thousands of people in 
the VA who were sadists and who were thieves and who were bullies and they were horrible to our vets who weren't in prime time for themselves. If they were, they wouldn't have been harassed like they were harassed. But we had 9,000 people, over 9,000 people. They couldn't get rid because of civil service statutes and requirements. And I got that knocked out in Congress, and they fired about 9,000 savage, horrible people. And then we got choice where, think of it, you had people waiting in line in the VA for days and weeks and months, sometimes with a very simple problem, simple ailment. And I said, I have an idea, a great idea. I told a group of experts, they're all sitting, about 20 guys, 20 people. And they're sitting in front of me and said, I have a great idea. Why don't we do this? If they can't get good service from the doctors in the VA, and by the way, they're great doctors. What they do is unbelievable. When you see them take a soldier who got just blown to pieces and, frankly, put them back together brilliantly, it's amazing. Couldn't have been done five years ago. But when you see the work they do, but you can't get to the doctors because of the administration and what they're doing. I said, you go out, you get a doctor, get a great doctor, get yourself fixed up, and we pay the bill. And nobody believed I got that through Congress. I got it through Congress. And we're saving thousands and thousands of people. Those two things, choice and accountability, were fantastic achievements. And, uh, you know, we got a 92 percent approval rating in the VA. Nobody else has ever gotten more than 50 percent. People don't know that. So the vets definitely like me, and I like them, too. We fully rebuilt the U.S. military and created Space Force, first time in 78 years. And the Space Force is a big deal, by the way. No, there's some, are you from Space Force by any chance? I think. Boy, they were very happy back there. No, oh, I see, good. That's great, thank you very much, that's very nice. And we got our allies to pay their fair share and bring it in over $400 billion to NATO. They weren't paying their bills, you've been reading about it. I've been saying, look, if they're not gonna pay, we're not gonna protect, okay? And Biden has said, oh, this is so bad, this is so terrible that he would say that, no. If they're not paying their bills, and most of them weren't when I got there, and when they asked me a question, they said, does this mean one of the heads of one of the countries, that, at that time we had 28 countries, of which seven were paying their fair share, which was still low, but seven. The United States was paying for almost all of it. It was terrible. And I said, what's going on? They said, Bush will come in, make a speech, and leave. Obama would come in, make a speech, and leave. Nobody would say anything about it. When I came in, I didn't make a speech. I looked at the numbers. I said, these numbers are terrible. Nobody's paying their bills. And I told them that. And then I came back six months later. I said, now you have had time. But one of the heads of the country stood up and said, does that mean that if we don't pay the bills, that you're not going to protect us? I said, that's exactly what it means, exactly. I'm not going to protect you. We don't want to be a stupid country any longer. And the next day, the money came pouring in you. If I said, if I said like all the — Obama said it, it would have nothing to do, and Obama, they probably liked him much better than me. He said, no, no, that would have no effect. Don't pay your bills, we'll protect you. No, if I say that, they're never going to pay the bills. Hundreds of billions of dollars came pouring into NATO, and I said it just the other day because they've been very lax. We spent 150, maybe 200, because now they want to give them $60 billion more. 60 billion, with a B. They want to give them 60 billion more. And I said, wait a minute, do it this way. Loan them the money. If they can make it, they pay us back. If they can't make it, they don't have to pay us back. Loan them the money. Put it as a form of a loan. Why should you just hand it over to them? Do it as a form of a loan. I do that with athletes. They can't quite, you know, like a professional golfer, who I think is very good. They don't have any money, but they have a lot of talent. I'll say, here's the deal. I did it with a number of people. Here's the deal, what I want to do. Professional golfer, I play golf. I play very nice. Did you see the picture of me, the horrible picture with the stomach out to here? That was — so what I do is I'm putting up today a picture of me actually, what I actually look like, hitting a ball, smashing the frickin' ball. And you'll see, quite — I wouldn't say slim. I wouldn't say slim, but not bad. 
But the ball does go far. I would say it goes about nine times further than Biden can hit it nine times. He said he's a six handicap. That may be his biggest light. Do you ever notice? Pilots come in and he said he flew planes. Truckers came in, he says he flew. Military come in, he says I was in the military. Well, they're all lies. His biggest lie is that he's a 6.2 handicap. I've seen him swing. He's like this. That's not. I know a lot about golf. That's not a 6.2. And it wasn't a 6.2 30 years ago. That's a bigger lie than the fact that he flies and he drives trucks. That guy is something, I'll tell you. Think of it. Think of what happened. They just came out with a report. They said he's not competent enough to defend himself in court, but he's competent enough to be president of the United States. How does that work? How does that work? But me, I got to go through a trial, and I had a thing called the Presidential Records Act. I did absolutely nothing wrong. But we, I don't, I don't know, I don't like, I wouldn't have liked that, that verdict. You can not defend yourself in court because you're grossly incompetent. You don't memory, you don't have any memory. You're a disaster. But you can be President of the United States. I don't want a president that's not allowed to go in and at least talk and defend himself. So they're protecting him. They're actually protecting him, but they're not protecting our country. Our country's in big trouble. But we still have a lot to do. We're going to do things that you can't even believe. We're going to do it fast, too. Under Biden, 19 out of 30 other NATO members do not even pay the bare minimum of 2%. Think of that, of GDP. You're supposed to pay 2% of GDP, which is a very low number. I thought it should go up to 4. Meanwhile, we're sending colossal amounts of our own weaponry and ammunition to Ukraine and money, including over 760 tanks, fighting vehicles, and armored personnel carriers, 35,000 grenade launchers and small arms, and over 100,000 anti-armor missile systems. Do you remember a year ago when Biden made the statements that we have no ammunition? This stupid guy, he's saying, even if it's true, you don't say it. You don't say it. He said, remember, he was at a news conference. I thought it was one of the classics. Uh, we, ha we have no ammunition. Because we've sent it all to different countries, in particular Ukraine. How do you say that? When I rebuilt the military, every warehouse was stocked. We had so much ammunition, we, we didn't have enough warehouses. We had the opposite problem. But he said, we have no ammunition. And I said, even if it was true, you just don't say that. Don't bring it up. That's a subject you don't want to. And you go get the ammunition fast. But what's happened to our military with the wokeness and everything else is a disgrace. It's only woke at the top, by the way. Our military, don't forget, I took out ISIS, and I took them out fast. And then we didn't go into wars. First time in 72 years, I took out ISIS, got rid of the worst savages in history. I got them out. I knocked them out. We knocked them out faster. They said it was going to take four years. It took me three months, less than three months. Our military is great. General Raisin Cain, our military is great. And our military is being dangerously drained and depleted while our own border remains wide open. So we're all over the place everywhere but where we should be. We have to be in our border. And I built, in fact, it was today, they finally put it up. I built 571 miles of wall. That's a lot. That's much more than I said I was going to build. I then bought another 200 miles that would have taken approximately three weeks. It was all set to install. And we had the rigged election, and the other side took over, and they sold that 200 miles of stuff for like five cents on the Think of it, five cents on the dollar. They sold it. They sold this unbelievable. That was exactly what Border Patrol. I didn't want that particular wall. I wanted to use concrete plank going 40 feet up in the air would have been fine, but they said no good. Concrete's not strong. They needed a hardened steel, then they needed concrete inside, they needed rebar. It's very complicated stuff, but they needed the panel. It's called an anti climb panel. I said, I don't like the way it looks. They say the difference is they can climb over it without it, with it. You can't climb. We had 
Mount Everest climbers, and we had a lot of drug deals, frankly. We said, give us your best climbers. And they couldn't get over the paddle. We built, we built five, I think it was 571 miles of wall. We had another 200 miles to go. It would have been up in three weeks. And these guys said, we don't want to do that. We want to have open borders. And I never believed they did, because who the hell wants open borders? Who would want it? Who would want it? And they come in by the millions. And they're coming from jails and prisons. There's a slight difference, if you know that. And they're coming from mental institutions and insane asylums. There was a man in the paper not so long ago, I guess a psychiatrist who worked in one of the mental institutions in South America. And he was sitting reading a newspaper. They were interviewing him. He said, you know, I've never had time to read a newspaper. It's a luxury because I work 29 hours a day. He was saying more than I better check that because, you know, when I say 29, meaning they work more than 24. But if I say 29 without a perfect, you know, meaning more than 24 to you fake news people. They work 29 hours a day. They'll say, he thought that a day has 29 hours in it. Oh, they are so bad. They're a big part of the problem of our country, by the way. I got to say, a big part, the fake news. But he said, I work 29 hours a day. I work all the time. That's all I ever did. But now I don't have to work very much because almost everybody in this institute, a mental institution, Almost everybody in our institution, you could see he loved it, actually. Loved what he did, but he said, I have nothing to do because they've all been brought to America. They've all been brought to the United States. These are mental patients. These are some very sick people, too. Very, very sick, dangerous people. And he was complaining. He was not complaining. I mean, I think he understood it. But he said they won't be given the care that we gave them. He was a little, you know, torn, to be honest. But he said they're very dangerous people. But they've all been brought to America. And if I were one of the guys in South America, or all over the world, by the way, this is not just South America. They're coming in from the Congo. They're coming in from Africa, Asia, South America. They're coming from the Middle East. Many, many people are coming in. They're coming in from Yemen. We're bombing Yemen. Here we go with the bombs all over the place again. That will never happen. You know that Israel being attacked would never have happened. You know that Ukraine would never, ever have happened. Would never have happened. You know inflation would never have happened. But before I even arrive at the Oval Office, I will win the presidency. I will be doing things that will be amazing. Like, I will get the war between Russia and Ukraine settled forthwith. It'll be settled very quickly. President Putin of Russia has just given me a great compliment, actually. He's just said that he would much rather have Joe Biden as president than Trump. Now, that's a compliment. A lot of people said, oh, gee, that's too bad. No, no, that's a good thing. And of course, he would say that. Look, I'm the one that stopped Nord Stream 2, probably the biggest pipeline anywhere in the world. But immediately, Biden, think of it. Biden immediately, I stopped it. It was dead. It was a dead deal. It was going all over Europe, in, to Germany in particular, going to be the biggest deal they ever made. That was the biggest deal they ever made. I stopped it. It was stopped dead. He got into office, and he immediately approved it. I said, I can't believe it. I'm sitting back there. I say, I couldn't believe it. But he did stop immediately the Keystone Pipeline in our country. So he approved the pipeline for Russia in Europe, where they're sucking all of the money out of Europe. Think of it. We're defending Germany and all these countries. They're not paying their bills. Germany's paying just a minor fraction of what they're And yet they're buying oil and gas in mass, in billions and billions of dollars a month. They're buying oil and gas from Russia. So they're paying Russia a lot of money. We're there defending them. And they don't. the whole thing is screwed up. But I stopped Nord Stream 2, and he approved it right after I left. So Putin is not a fan of mine, actually. You remember when they used to say, oh, Trump, you know, they had a body language person on CNN fake news. And they had me and Putin together. And they said to the expert, well, who's the dominant force? And the expert said, as you know, I've analyzed it. I've spent a lot of time doing it. And I don't think you're going to like the answer. But President Trump is the dominant force. Said that. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's true.
Remember, we both walked on and — but I got along good with him. But he doesn't want to have me. He wants to have Biden because he's going to be given everything he wants, including Ukraine. That's a gift. He's got a gift. He's going to have his dream of getting Ukraine because of Biden. The whole thing is just crazy. Biden has given him — the only president in the last five that hasn't given Russia anything is a president known as Donald J. Trump. You know that. I don't have to go over the list. But Biden — Biden is going to give him Ukraine, the way it's looking to me. It's terrible. So Putin came out, and he said, I'd much rather have Biden be president. And I said, well, that's insulting. And then I said, wait a minute. That's actually a very good thing. I think I'll mention it tonight at the speech in front of the people of South Carolina. The war would — that's a war. And it's, you know, I think everyone agrees. A lot of Democrats agree. They say, well, I agree that that would never happen. But that's a war that never would have happened if I was president. Under the Trump administration, we will return to peace through strength. Remember when Hillary Clinton, during the debate — remember those debates? Oh, they were great debates. Only Rosie O'Donnell. Remember that is? Only that brought the House down. They were great debates. But you remember, she said, he'll start a war. He's a very militaristic person. He's going to start a war. Look at him. He's going to — I said, no, my personality is going to keep us out of war. That's what happened. Our personality kept us out. Again, the first — and I think they said 72 years it didn't start a war, other than we got rid of ISIS. We knocked the hell out of them. Three years ago, we had the most secure border in U.S. history. We ended catch and release. We built 571 miles of border wall. We got Mexico to send 28,000 soldiers to our border, free of charge. You think that was easy? I said to Mexico, we need 28,000 soldiers. They laughed at me. I said, don't laugh. You're going to give them to me, because you couldn't get the money for the wall. So I had to do something, right? I have to keep my pledge. You're not allowed to do — there's no legal mechanism where they pay for a wall that we have on our territory. So I said, that's okay. We'll think of something else. We want 28,000 soldiers. So they left. No, 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 we will not do that. I said, yes, you 100 percent. No, no, no. Then — and the president, who I like a lot, actually. I like him. He's a socialist, but I like him, nevertheless. And he, uh, he said, no, we can't do this. I said, send your representative. I don't want to really negotiate with you. It's disrespectful. Send your representative. So they said this very handsome guy comes into Washington. I was with a woman from the State Department. I asked Tom Holman and Brandon Judd. They're great. I said, give us a top 10 list of things that you want. I'll get every one of them. They said, you'll never get them. We've been trying to get them for years. I said, just give me a list. I'll get every one of them. I guarantee you that. So this guy comes in, very handsome guy, beautiful suit. In fact, I was going to ask him, who's your tailor? I like it very much. <laughs> and I said to him, we need 28,000 soldiers. We need remain in Mexico. We need catch and release in Mexico, not in the United States. We call it catch and release Mexico version, not catch and release U.S. version, where they drop them. A criminal, what have you done? Murder. Okay, you'll come back in seven years. We're going to give you a case. And nobody ever shows back, unless they're very stupid. The stupid ones come. You don't want them either. <laughs> nobody comes back. You know, we catch and release. We release them, and then we say, come back in four years, five years. They never come back, as obviously nobody would. Who would? We were the stupidest people on Earth. But I asked for 10 things. But remain in Mexico is a big one. You couldn't come in here. You had to remain in Mexico until we decide whether or not you could come in, of which 95 percent, maybe more than that, couldn't come in. That was me! And Biden ended it. So I said to this handsome guy, I said, no, we need 28,000 soldiers immediately. I'm building the wall. The wall will take care of itself. But we need them, especially during the wall. No, 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 we will not do that. Yes, you will. No, you won't. We won't do it, sir. He said, no way. I said, way. You're going to do it? I said, I guarantee you, you're going to do it. I guarantee you. He's looking at me like, is this guy crazy? I told him no. And I said, I guarantee you, you're going to do it. Because I have before me a document, and the document says — this was a Friday evening — it says on Monday morning at 7 o'clock, a tariff will be imposed on all of the cars and all of the other billions and billions of dollars' worth of stuff that you send into our country. You know, they stole 32 percent of our automobile manufacturing business. And by the way, with the head of the auto workers, they're going to do it again with his all-electric car mandate, because those cars are all going to be built in China. 
okay? They're, what they've done to the auto workers, United Auto Workers, they're all going to vote for me because I'm going to bring all that business back. I'm going to bring it all back because we're going to impose tariffs on cars coming in from foreign countries, and they're going to have to build they're going to have to build those cars in our country. So, and they're going to hire United Auto Workers and a lot of other auto workers that you have right here in your great state. But they want to take all that business away. So I said to him, you're going to do this. And uh, he said, no. I said, uh, here's the story. Monday morning, 7 o'clock. He said, sir, you don't mean that. I said, no, I totally mean it. I'm ready to sign it right now. I actually had the document done. Do you want me to sign it or not? He said, may I take five minutes and call my president? I said, absolutely. Comes back in about two minutes. Sir, we would be absolutely in love with giving you 28,000 soldiers, sir. We think it's a wonderful idea. We will give you remain in Mexico. We will give you all sorts of titles for the bad. You know, we have a lot of sick people, and we want to take care of people, but we don't want them infecting our people. Does that make sense to you? They have a lot of very sick people coming in. Now we have everything coming in. They gave up everything. They gave up remain in Mexico. And the other day, I saw where Mexico wants $10 billion just to talk to the United States. They wouldn't be saying that to me, I can tell you right now. We have stupid people running our country. We've had for years. And we broke it up. And then we had a crooked election. But we're going to come back stronger, bigger, better. We're going to do a better job than anyone's ever seen before. <laughs> Under Biden, we now have the worst border in the history of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is a lively group. This is a lively group, Henry. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I think, I think Nikki's in big trouble, big, big trouble. Who wants her? Who the hell wants her? No, we had uh, the worst border in, in world history. There's never been a border. I say it all the time. You take a third world country, you take a banana republic, there's no way a thing like this ever happened. They would fight with sticks and stones. They wouldn't allow that to happen to their country. There's never been anything worse than our border. And you know, the biggest victims, I just started saying this because I realized these are the biggest victims. It's millions and millions of people. They're pouring into our country. The biggest victims are African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, people that want a job, people that really feel they want a job. They're getting decimated in their hourly wages. It's happening already. And you know, another big victim group, it's not so much down here. You don't have too many of them, frankly. But the unions are going to be destroyed. The auto workers are going to be destroyed. The Teamsters are going to be destroyed. Because they get big hourly wages. And let's say that that's fine. But they're not going to be able to compete when these people are coming in. And they're coming in at levels never seen before. Unions are going to be totally decimated. A lot of the workers in our country. But the worst devastation is going to be the African-American and Hispanic-American people. They're going to be decimated. So I have an extra thing. You know, we, because the crowd is so crazy tonight and so large, it is crazy. You got to see what was, what's going on outside. If you want, you know, we do a thing called the snake. Does anybody want to hear it or should we just get on with it? Yes? Yes? We'll do it? Oh. What the heck? It's a couple of more minutes. We got plenty of time, right? So are you ready? That's right. He said he's been here. He's been waiting all day. He'd like to hear it. They have been. This front row, I'll tell you, front row Joes, they become very famous people, actually. So you know what this is. This is a, a song that was written many years ago, and I changed it around a little bit. And made it toward, really, immigration, because we're taking in so many dangerous people, and bad things happen when you do that. You take in dangerous people, it's going to end up biting you. On her way to work one morning, down the path along the lake, a tender-hearted woman saw a poor, half-frozen snake. 
His pretty colored skin had been all frosted with the dew. Poor thing, she cried, I'll take you in and I'll take care of you. Take me in, O oh, tender woman, take me in for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh, tender woman, sighed the vicious snake. She wrapped him up all cozy in a comforter of silk and laid him by her fireside with some honey and some milk. She hurried home from work that night, and soon as she arrived, she found the pretty snake she'd taken in had been revived. Take me in, O oh, tender woman, take me in for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh, tender woman, sighed the vicious snake. She clutched him to her bosom. You're so beautiful, she cried. But if I hadn't brought you in by now, you truly would have died. She stroked his pretty skin again and kissed and held him tight. But instead of saying, thank you, ma'am, the snake gave her a vicious bite. Take me in, O oh, tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh, tender woman, sighed the vicious snake. I saved you, cried the woman, and you've bitten me, but why? You know, your bite is poisonous, and now I'm going to die. Shut up, silly woman, said the reptile with a grin. You knew damn well I was a snake before you took me in. Huh? That's what's happening to our country. That's what's happening to our country. That's exactly what it is. It couldn't be more accurate. That's uh, sad. I hate, in a way, I hate doing it even, but people like hearing it. They've heard it 500 times. I only do it probably once every 10 times. But I gave you the option. But you know, it's very accurate, actually. That's exactly, we're waiting, we're sitting ducks. They're terrorists are pouring into our country. Nobody's checking anything. Drug dealers pouring in. And you're never going to solve the drug problem unless you have a death penalty for drug dealers because it, you're just kidding yourself. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, launch a blue ribbon community. A blue, beautiful blue ribbon committee of socialites from New York, California, and all over the country to tell you about drugs and the drug problem. They can't do it. They're not going to be able to do it. The only thing that works is the death penalty. Don't forget, a drug dealer kills anywhere from 500, maybe to 1,000, but 500, a minimum of 500 people during his or her lifetime. 500 people. And, you know, when I was in China, I used to get along great with President Xi, and I'd say, do you have a drug problem? No, 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 we don't. Like, like it was a stupid question, I'm asking. I said, you don't have a drug problem, why? He said, quick trial. I said, what's a quick trial? We catch the drug dealer, we gave him a quick trial, and we execute him, and we no longer have any problems because all those people have come to the USA. They have no drug problem. They have no 1.4 billion people, they have no drug problem. We have a drug problem with them because they send fentanyl in and they weren't going to do it anymore. We had a deal worked out. They weren't going to do it. They were going to give the maximum penalty for anybody making fentanyl, sending it into the United States. But when I got out and Biden, who can't put two sentences together, came back in, when he came in, it all died. We were all set to make that deal. And he had to make that deal or we were going to stop trading with him. We we're going to stop trading because he's killing hundreds of thousands of our people, worse than a war. Hundreds of thousands of our people are dying each year with fentanyl, mostly made in China and coming through the southern border. Now it's pouring in at 15 times the pace that it was just three years ago. It's pouring into our country. It's cheaper to buy fentanyl than it is to and other drugs than it is to buy candy. Candy is more expensive. On day one, I will terminate every open borders policy of the Biden administration, and we will begin the largest domestic deportation operation in American history because we have no choice. We will restore law and order to our country, and I will direct a completely overhaul DOJ, which is right now corrupt, to investigate every radical, out-of-control prosecutor in America for their illegal, racist, and reverse enforcement of the law.
And I am also going to indemnify all police officers and law enforcement officials throughout the United States to protect them from being destroyed by the radical left for taking strong action on crime. We let we have to let them immediately start working on crime. You saw today another group of wonderful people were killed in Washington, D.C. We're going to fix Washington, D.C. We're going to make it crime-free. We're going to take it over by the federal government. We're going to run it properly instead of these third-rate politicians that are destroying it. We're going to move the homeless out. We're going to make it beautiful again. We're going to get rid of the graffiti. We're going to redo the roads that are falling apart. We're going to get rid of the garbage on all the roads. It's a horrible place right now. It's a death trap for anybody that walks into Washington, D.C. You would go down to Washington, D.C. You were so proud of it. It's a death trap. We're going to take it over. We're also going to rebuild our cities into beacons of hope and safety and beauty better than they have ever been. We'll work with Democrat mayors. They're all run. They're all run by the Democrats, unlike Nikki Haley, who doesn't have what it takes and never did, actually. I will always defend Medicare and Social Security for our seniors. She won't. On day one, I will sign a new executive order to cut federal funding for any school pushing critical race theory, transgender insanity, and other inappropriate racial, sexual, or political content onto the lives of our children. And I will not give one penny to any school that has a vaccine mandate or a mask mandate. And I cannot believe, I have to say this, it's embarrassing to even say it. Five years, ten years ago, I can't even imagine this, but I will keep men out of women's sports. Is that okay? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And fully uphold our great Second Amendment. Nobody took care of our Second Amendment. During that four-year period, nothing happened with our Second Amendment. We will protect innocent life, and we will restore free speech. And I will secure our elections. Our goal will be one-day voting with paper ballots and voter ID. Very simple. But until then, Republicans must win. If you took the 10 worst presidents in the history of the United States and added them up, they would not have done near the destruction to our country as Joe Biden and the Biden administration have done. There's never been anything like this happen. It's not even the same country that we knew. And believe me, they are a threat to democracy. They are a serious threat. They are the threat. They like to talk, talk, talk. You know, let's see, how do we beat Trump? Because they have nothing to run on. So they're going to run on Trump. That's okay with me, because I think we have the greatest movement in the history of our country. MAGA, MAGA, make America great again. So if you want to save our country, if you want to save America, then you have to go and vote. Remember, the primary is Saturday, February 24th, and in-person early voting is underway right now. If you need details, it's sc.donaldjtrump.com. Don't wait. Go cast your ballot right away. So. We're coming to the end of a beautiful evening in a beautiful place. In conclusion, together we're taking a, somebody said, yeah, keep going. No, no, don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop, please. Don't stop, sir. Please keep going. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it shows you you're desperate to hear from somebody because this other guy never gets up and talks. If he talks for like a minute, he goes, uh, uh. It's like, it's crazy. You know, a friend of mine said, I saw a poll, you're up nine. He's not a politician, he's not into politics at all. He said, how come you're only up nine? And nine is a lot for a Republican because they have a built-in vote. 
the lowest they can go is 39 percent. He's at 32. That's — it's almost impossible. In other words, the lowest they can go is 39, and he's at 32. But he was saying, how come you're only up? I said, because they have different — we're not going to talk about them, because I think a lot of those people are going to vote for us, actually, so I'm not going to talk about them. But they have a built-in constituency like you wouldn't believe. We don't. We have to run the entire East Coast. We have to run the Midwest. We have to get Texas. We love Texas. You know, we're leading bird brain in Texas by a number that's never been seen before. We're at 89 to 7 with a few undecided. 89 to 7. We love Texas. But together, we're taking on some of the most menacing forces and vicious opponents our people have ever seen. But no matter how hateful and corrupt the communists and criminals we're fighting against may be, you must never forget this nation does not belong to them. This nation belongs to you. This is your home. This is your heritage. And our American liberty is your God-given right. It's your God-given right. From Columbia to Clemson, from Greenville to Garden City, from Lexington to Charleston, we stand on the shoulders of South Carolina heroes who crossed the ocean, settled the continent, tamed the wilderness, laid down the railroads, raised up those great skyscrapers, won two world wars, defeated fascism and communism, and made America the single greatest nation in the history of the world. But now, we are a nation in decline. We are a failing nation. We are a nation that has the highest inflation in 50 years, where banks are collapsing and interest rates are skyrocketing. Likewise, we are a nation where energy costs have reached the highest levels in our history. We are no longer energy independent or energy dominant as we were just a few short years ago. We are a nation that is begging Venezuela and others for oil. Please, please, please help us, Joe Biden says. Yet we have more liquid gold under our feet than any other country anywhere in the world. We are a nation that just recently heard that Saudi Arabia and Russia will be reducing their oil production while at the same time substantially increasing the price. And we met that threat by announcing that we will no longer be drilling for oil in large areas of Alaska and elsewhere on our land. We are a nation that is consumed by the radical left's Green New Deal, yet everyone knows that the Green News scam is fake and will lead to our destruction. We are a nation whose leaders are demanding all electric cars despite the fact that they don't go far, cost too much, and whose batteries are produced in China with material only available in China when an unlimited amount of gasoline is available inexpensively in the United States, but it's not available in China. And now we are a nation that wants to make our revered and very powerful army tanks the best anywhere in the world, all electric, so that despite the fact that they are also not able to go far, fewer pollutants will be released into the air as we blast our way through enemy territory in an environmentally friendly way. And they also want to make our fighter jets with a green stamp of energy savings, though losing 15% efficiency but allowing us to keep our enemy's atmosphere clean of emissions as we viciously and unceremoniously attack them 
at levels never seen before. Who are these people that would do this to us? Who are these fools? Who are these people who would ruin our country? We are a nation that ended oil exploration and production in the U.S. just as the price of oil reached an all-time high. What other country would do such a stupid thing? Who would ever be so self-destructive as this? Can we be energy independent and even dominant? Yes, so oh yes, quickly, says President Donald J. Trump. We will be energy independent again very quickly. We are a nation that surrendered in Afghanistan, leaving dead soldiers, American citizens, and $85 billion worth of the finest military equipment in the world behind, and also abandoning Bagram, one of the biggest military bases in the world, and only one hour away from where China makes its nuclear weapons. And we are a nation that allowed Russia and Ukraine to fight killing hundreds of thousands of people, and it will only get worse. It would never have happened with me as your president, and for four straight years, it didn't happen. Likewise, the horrifying attack on Israel would never have happened. They wouldn't even have thought of doing such a thing if President Trump was sitting in the Oval Office. Would never, ever have been thought of. Iran was broke under the Trump administration, totally broke. They didn't have the money to fund Hamas and Hezbollah and all of the other instruments of terror that they fund. But those sanctions were lifted by a corrupt Biden administration. And now Iran is a rich country again, with $200 billion and another $6 billion for hostages and $10 billion for electricity to Iraq. All compliments of the incompetent Joe Biden administration. And China, with Taiwan, is next. We are a nation that allows radical left terrorists to violently attack our cities, leaving behind massive destruction and death. And nothing happens to the criminals that do these terrible things. There is absolutely no punishment. But when people who love our country protest the January 6th in Washington, D.C., they become hostages, unfairly imprisoned for long periods of time. We are a third world nation now that has weaponized its law enforcement against the opposing political party like never before. We've got a Federal Bureau of Investigation that won't allow bad election-changing facts to be presented to the public and which offers $1 million to a writer of fiction about Donald J. Trump to lie and say it was fact, where Hunter Biden's laptop from hell was Russian disinformation, and the FBI knew it wasn't, but 51 intelligence agents said it was, and a Department of Justice that refuses to investigate egregious acts of voting irregularities and fraud. And we have a man who is totally corrupt and the worst president in the history of our country, who is cognitively impaired, in no condition to lead, and is now in charge of dealing with Russia and possible nuclear war, which would be World War III and far more devastating than any of the previous world wars because of the weaponry that no one even wants to think about. We are a nation that no longer has a free and fair press. Fake news is all you get, and they are indeed the enemy of the people. They refuse to discuss the Biden crime family, but enjoy covering the false indictments of Donald J. Trump, who has done nothing wrong except win an election that wasn't supposed to be won. We are a nation where free speech is no longer allowed, and where crime is rampant and out of control like never before. We are a nation that is allowing Iran to build a massive nuclear weapon and China to use the trillions and trillions of dollars it has taken from us to build a military to rival our own. And less than three years ago, we had Iran, China, Russia, and North Korea in check. 
They respected us. They were afraid of us. They weren't going to do a thing against us. And everyone knows it. Now Russia and China are holding summits to carve up the world. And perhaps most importantly, we are a nation that is no longer admired, respected, or listened to on the world stage. We are a nation that in many ways has become a joke. And we are a nation that is hostile to liberty, freedom, faith, and even God. We are a nation whose economy is collapsing into a cesspool of ruin, whose supply chain is broken, whose stores are not stocked, whose deliveries are not coming, and whose educational system is ranked at the very bottom of every single list. We are a nation that sold a once great company, United States Steel, to Japan. We are a nation whose stock market's continued success is contingent on MAGA winning the next election. And we are a nation where large packs of sadistic criminals and thieves are allowed to go into stores and openly rob them, beat up and kill their workers and customers, and leave with arms of goods, but there'll be no retribution at all. Where the authority of our great police has been taken, where their families and pensions have been threatened, and lives, their lives, their beautiful lives would be destroyed for the mere mention of the words law enforcement. We are a nation where fentanyl and other forms of illegal drugs are easier to get than groceries to feed our beautiful families. We have become a drug-infested, crime-ridden nation, which is incapable of solving even the simplest of problems. We will institute the powerful death penalty for drug dealers, where each dealer is responsible for the death during their lives of more than 500 people or more. Mothers will never again be forced to watch their children overdosing and hopelessly dying in their arms, screaming, what can I do, what can I do, my child, my child, my child. We are a nation whose once revered airports are a dirty, crowded mess. You sit and wait for hours and then are notified that the plane won't leave. They have no idea when it will where ticket prices have tripled. They don't have the pilots to fly the planes. They don't see qualified air traffic controllers anymore, and they just don't know what the hell they're doing. We are a nation that screens its citizens viciously at all ports. But if you're an illegal alien, you're allowed to flow through our southern border totally unchecked. Dangerous as hell, but totally unchecked. Let them be free, let them be free, claims Joe Biden. We are a nation that has lost its confidence, willpower, and lost its strength. We are a nation that has quite simply lost its way. But we are not going to allow this horror to continue. Three years ago, we were a great nation, and we will soon be a great nation again. It was hardworking patriots like you who built this country, and it is hardworking patriots like you who are going to save our country. We will fight for America like no one has ever fought before. 2024 is our final battle. With you at my side, we will demolish the deep state. We will expel the warmongers from our government. We will drive out the globalists. We will cast out the communists, Marxists, and fascists. And we will throw off the sick political class that hates our countries. We will rout the fake news media. We will drain the swamp. And we will liberate our country from these tyrants and villains once and for all. Like those patriots before us, we will not bend. We will not break. We will not yield. We will never give in. We will never give up. We will never, ever, ever back down. With your support, we will go on to victory, the likes of which no one has ever seen before. We will evict Joe Biden from the White House. And we will take back our country on Election Day, 
2024, Crooked Joe Biden will be gone. The great silent majority is rising like never before. And under our leadership, the forgotten man and woman will be forgotten no longer. We are one movement, one people, one family, and one glorious nation under God. We are the greatest movement in the history of our country. We are MAGA. Make America great again. Together, we will make America powerful again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America great again. Thank you, South Carolina. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you all.